Um, hello everyone and welcome to the UBC Talks webinar on the topic water as a resource um, in the climate resilient city. My name is Agnieszka Ilola and I'm project coordinator at the Union of the Baltic City Sustainable Cities Commission. And I will be serving as a moderator today together with my colleague Maria Andreeva, who will be um, focusing on the technical side of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at ubc-sustainable.net. So as participants, your microphones will be muted during all webinar. However, we look forward to uh, your questions and you can use the Q&A box to type your questions to speakers and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Shortly about the, uh, the Union of the Baltic Cities uh, that I am uh, representing. Uh, the webinar is being organized by the Union of the Baltic Cities Sustainable Cities Commission. It is a voluntary network of over 70 cities in the Baltic Sea region working together to foster sustainable, green and safe growth in the urban areas. The UBC network works through its seven thematic commissions and the Sustainable Cities Commission is one of them. In the commission, we focus on our activities around water, climate change, energy, mobility, biodiversity and circular economy. And this UBC Talks webinar is an example of our work related to water and climate change. So the overall aim of the webinar series that we have been organizing uh, in the past and uh, recently and also a couple of ahead of us is to provide our member cities a platform for exchange of good practices and experiences within the network and also interested parties uh, beyond. This is actually a very special edition because usually we have always invited a guest from our network, but today we are going to look a little bit beyond the network and bring a little bit of expertise, excellence and uh, great solutions from uh, uh, other, uh, not our member cities, but from other excellent experts. Uh, further, the content of this webinar is closely linked to the ongoing UBC-led project BSR Water, which is uh, funded by the Interreg Baltic Sea Region program. The aim of the project is to strengthen the cooperation in sustainable water management by uh, sharing of existing good practices and supporting development of regional environmental policies and uh, as an example, uh, I could give the, uh, our contribution to the update of the Helsinki Commission policy recommendation uh, on the proper management of stormwater. So uh, the project is ending in September this year, and I encourage you to check the project achievements related to climate uh, adaptation uh, and water sector, sustainable water sector, uh, as well as stormwater management, so hazardous substances and nutrient recycling above all. Um, now I would like to uh, introduce a bit the agenda. So I will start with giving a quick overview of the schedule for today. Uh, so in a moment, I will introduce our four panelists and they will present for around 15, 15 minutes each on various issues uh, pertaining to the climate resilience uh, in urban water management, promotion on, of a green and blue urban spaces, natural flood risk management and preparedness to extreme uh, weather events. Thereafter, we will have 15 minutes discussion where our speakers will answer questions from the audience. Therefore, at any time of the webinar, you can post questions via Q&A pop-up window at the bottom of your screen. I will relay these questions to our speakers and uh, uh, we can exchange uh, during the discussion. So with that, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker, Ms. Barbara Anton, urban uh, water management expert in Sustainable Resources, Climate and Resilience Unit of ICLEI European Secretariat. Barbara is involved in issues closely related to sustainable water management, such as nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, climate change adaptation, uh, water governance, uh, and stakeholder engagement. Barbara, I will hand over to you. Welcome. 
Thank you, Agnieszka, for the introduction. I'm putting on my presentation here. Yes, hello to everyone. I'm, I'm very glad to have the privilege of speaking in this um, uh, workshop today. Um, and indeed, yeah, I've been um, working with ICLE for more than 25 years in the meantime. But uh, in the last um, years, I have especially uh, focused on the area of uh, sustainable urban water management, but also with the related issues on, on blueprint infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and also climate change adaptation. So this is why I think uh, it's, it's quite nice to have the possibility to speak here in, in this uh, context. Um, I would like to do a little bit of a, if you like, a warming up presentation and putting a little bit of frame also for the topic and for the other speakers who will then, as I understand, go into a bit more detail of practical solutions. So um, I will just remind ourselves again uh, briefly about the climate change impacts on our urban water systems, but then also beyond the urban water systems. Um, briefly explain ICLEI's um, pathway to resilience development, um, make some remarks on the overall uh, EU policy context at the moment, uh, but then go down to uh, the notion of integration and in how far it is actually key to, to leverage the multiple benefits that you can have through adaptation in the water sector. And I mentioned a few city examples but I guess more will come then also uh, in the later presentations. I would also like to say a few words on the Green City Accord. Some of you might have heard of it, uh, which has also um, a very prominent um, focus on the water sector. Um, and just briefly uh, use the opportunity also to announce our next European Urban Resilience Forum. And for those who don't know, um, ICLE is also a city network, but uh, it is a, a global uh, network which is promoting sustainability, urban sustainability in various ways and forms uh, through um, policy advocacy at higher levels, but also through technical support, through advice, um, through networking uh, with our member cities. I'm personally working in the European Secretariat in Freiburg. Uh, so I'm mainly looking at the European context, uh, but of course, we always also have uh, uh, projects and activities that go beyond the European boundaries. So this is uh, probably preaching to the converted and uh, most of you are, are fully aware um, that climate change has uh, so many different impacts on our urban systems. So with, um, we have both in many cities, even uh, throughout the year in, in one um, decreased uh, precip precipitation as one of the um, uh, hazards of climate change, as well as increased precipitation. With decreased precipitation, uh, this leads to water scarcity and this has uh, impacts on our systems like, um, for example, uh, our urban green spaces, for example, will not receive enough water anymore, which will have impacts on, on biodiversity and, and the ecosystem services. Or uh, it will reduce the stream flows um, of our waters, for example, the rivers. And the rivers often have um, implications for cooling our heating systems. Uh, so our energy uh, supply, for example, might be affected. Increased precipitation, I don't have to say a lot, flooding is uh, everywhere um, and um, it, it um, has implications on our water infrastructure, wastewater uh, systems are often overwhelmed um, and then um, yeah, polluted water flows into uh, our natural environment, for example. Um, yeah, and you could name numerous other implications, destruction um, of transport systems or interruption of transport systems, um, damages to other facilities. Um, of course, then also with uh, rising temperatures, um, you have also implications on the water system, like you might have, for example, increases in bacterial and fungal contents of waters, 
Um, that again has uh, implications for the water supply infrastructure. Um, and uh, yeah, he will have to, might have to increase uh, treatments for, for order and taste of water, for example. Um, or you have uh, higher um, uh, water coming or melting water coming from uh, ice and, and snow coverages and uh, that changes the peaks of um, fl peak flows in that timing and, and magnitude uh, of rivers, for example, and you have to deal with. It. So um, I don't want to go through all the details, but of course, climate change impacts our urban systems in many different ways and water often uh, is sort of a mediator. It has implications directly for the water systems, but then for other systems as well, for the energy sector, for the transportation sector, uh, and so on. So in, in ICLE, we um, are promoting very much the sustainable city. This is actually the, our core uh, activity. And of course, there are many ways to approach um, this, uh, to approach sustainability and you can work for uh, sustainability from very many different angles. We have um, defined these five strategic pathways um, that together can bring us further in our way to, on our way to, to sustainability. And this is one pathway, you know, looking at low emissions, at low emission development, one at nature-based development, uh, one at equitable and people-centered development, resilient development and circular development. And obviously, yeah, working towards resilience is one important component uh, on our way to sustainability. Um, we, we define resilient development to, in terms of anticipating, preventing, absorbing, and recovering from shocks and stresses, um, and uh, to improve uh, uh, and, and build and improve an essential basic response structure and function of the system. So this is what we're basically talking about today. And I think there are very many ways, of course, to do that. Um, this is the context in, in which resilience and, and sustainability fit uh, into our own work as ICLE, but at the moment we also benefit here in Europe a lot from the policy, latest policy developments with a new commission coming in and with the EU Green Deal being uh, launched, um, a lot of new policies have come up that are really very um, favorable for also supporting work at local level to, to bring the resilience agenda forward and also the water agendas. Um, and the new adaptation strategy, um, smarter adaptation, faster adaptation, more systemic adaptation play a big role. And in the faster um, adaptation, the uh, availability and sustainability of fresh water uh, sources is, is very much highlighted and there's a, a big uh, request also to that water use has to be sharply reduced given uh, the rising temperatures and uh, that we also have to keep a close eye on drinking water quality. When it comes to systemic adaptation, um, a, a number of cross-cutting priorities are formulated uh, and among the three priorities, more nature-based solutions are very much promoted. And it's nice to see that the speakers that are following uh, will have a lot to add on, on this part and uh, present a few nature-based solutions in, in more concrete terms also. Um, and there's also um, a very strong focus on the importance of the local, uh, on local adaptation plans and that, uh, it's even formulated in a way that it says the local level is the bedrock of adaptation because it's the cities that are hit by climate change in the first place um, and they have to get prepared. But as you know, the, the EU Green Deal has very many different uh, policy arenas and you can say a lot, uh, you can see a lot of, of other linkages uh, of the new policies coming out with, with water and the local level. 
I mean, just uh, recently the Zero uh, Pollution Action Plan has come out for air, water and soil, which obviously um, also speaks to water quality issues um, also related to climate change. Um, the biodiversity strategy has come out um, and um, is also looking at the um, restoration of freshwater ecosystems. Um, and again, um, there are linkages also to the robustness of, of water systems uh, to be ready for climate change. Um, the circular economy action plan and so on. So there are a lot of new policies that are all very supportive in terms of going ahead with adaptation work and working towards resilience. And it's from that point of view, while the challenges are rising, we also have a lot of supporting frameworks um, that, that help us move forward. So what I want to say is that um, we have to look at climate change, climate change adaptation from very many different angles. It's such a cross-cutting issues and it, there's so many chain effects from one sector to the next that we really have to keep in mind um, that we are, cannot uh, confine ourselves to just speaking about water and climate. It's, it's bigger than that. Um, it's, it's then uh, also looking at other sectors. So integration is sort of the call of the time. Um, while we have started for decades ago to make big strides forward to integrate the different domains of the water sector, meaning water supply, waste, water, storm water, which is also still a challenge and still has to be further worked on. Um, we also have to not only look at the bound city boundaries, but we also have to see water um, in its cycle uh, in, in the bigger watershed in the shared in the in the region around us. Um, that means, uh, and this is a big challenge, certainly still and will always be to make sure that we work together with all the stakeholders that are. Um, relevant uh, and, and in, in the water sector, uh, in the city, but also much beyond. This is not only the local government, not only the water utilities, but goes beyond to regulators and water users, the general public in the end. Um, and again, it's important to really look across the, the climate change, uh, those that are in charge of climate change adaptation in a city, uh, sometimes it's still sitting just in one department, but um, a really effective and impactful implementation, uh, adaptation um, activities will only be really uh, working if we also make sure that adaptation is also mainstreamed uh, across many other sectors that the city is working on. In terms of a systemic approach, the, um, a very systematic um, management process is of course also very important. Uh, I think most of you would be aware of it, no need to go into any details here, but of course we always have to start with a really thorough baseline review, formulate uh, proper targets, um, and move our planning through a political commitment process. Well, once we have the political commitment in place that uh, in, at local level, then we can also be sure that there will be budget allocated to make things happen. And our implementation has always to be accompanied by a very um, stringent monitoring process um, that also allows us to evaluate the impact of our work, um, report back, uh, to the political level, but also to, to the public and maybe change our approaches if necessary. So, so in, to, to stay with integration, um, I think while the tasks that are ahead of us are really huge and sometimes maybe might look like they are too big to, to conquer, um, we also have to think about the multiple benefits that one action can bring to other sectors. And also whatever penny we put into the water sector now will also have implications on other sectors and have benefits there. So 
um, we have to coordinate obviously very uh, carefully with other sectors, but also be aware that there are often um, yeah, multiple uh, outcomes uh, that from, from one activity in, in our own sphere of work. Um, generally speaking, whatever we are doing should not only be good, you know, to make sure that our water infrastructures and our uh, systems are becoming resilient, but also contribute to the quality of life of our citizens in a more general sense. This is what a local government stands for in any case to make sure that, you know, the citizens uh, can enjoy um, a really good life in the city and, and to, to manage water uh, sustainably will certainly be one of the big components to make this happen. Um, our water management and our adaptation activities are also there to support livelihoods. Again, of course, uh, having uh, big implications on the quality of life and the local economy. We have to make sure that um, we reuse our resources efficiently and, and also make, you know, yeah, make sure that the money that we invest has implications, positive implications on other uh, areas. And just re-emphasizing, we also always have to keep in mind that we coordinate and collaborate closely with other sectors that are immediately um, uh, concerned by what we are doing within the water sector, whether this is our colleagues working in biodiversity, in, in air quality, in energy efficiency, in transportation, and so on. So when we are thinking on, about water adaptation, we it's good to always think big and uh, look beyond the sector, look at what other benefits we can achieve. Um, I'm just mentioning three examples here. The list could be long, and uh, I understand that my colleagues speaking here uh, later on, they will also be a little bit, uh, go into more detail and deep dive into a number of very concrete applications. So I'm going outside, consciously outside of the Baltic Sea region um, to, yeah, also show a few inspirational um, activities in, in other areas of, of Europe, but of course the list could be very long. Here, for example, um, I am I'm mentioning Ghent, the city of Ghent in, in Belgium, um, that has also um, just lately um, published their structural vision 2030, which they call mm -hmm. Room for Ghent. And it's, it, um, it's a very good illustration also for water, how water adaptation and urban greening can be closely uh, connected and um, yeah, also provide um, mutual advantages then. Um, they focus very much on, on spatial measures and um, the, I mean, they are trying to, to also um, bring together uh, their efforts for climate neutrality and climate uh, uh, resilience um, into rolling out uh, a very uh, well thought through green and blue infrastructure network. Um, and they see very much of how greening together with uh, water elements in the city can help to mitigate the heat island effects and cool down the city in summertime which is very important in many cities throughout Europe nowadays. Um, and at the same time, um, yeah, they are also providing more space for water. Um, they um, look at opportunities to uh, also provide places or create space for water storage in public spaces and consider the city as a sponge, not just, um, moving away water after heavy rainwater events, but also keeping it, storing it and making it available for times uh, when, when the water is scarce. So water adaptation and urban greening is very closely connected and should always be uh, developed together. 
we can also think about water adaptation and biodiversity enhancement. So uh, what we are doing in the water sector might have implications on, on biodiversity, which should not be missed. We all know how dramatic the loss of biodiversity is nowadays. Uh, for example, here I'm going uh, south to Portugal, to Almada, and their Reduna project. Um, so what they had through yeah, stormwater searches, uh, or, or yeah, they had more and more problems with uh, the sand being taken away from their stretch of the coast. Um, and for a while they had moved sand back into the area, but of course the same thing happened uh, all over again and again. And um, here they have now started to plant more um, uh, intensively as, a specific um, uh, species of, of uh, root, um, how do you call them, um, uh, dune plant spaces, willows, willows uh, along the dunes. Um, and while they were doing it, so they, they planted really uh, hundreds of these, these uh, willows, but also made sure uh, to select a, a willow that was um, a, a local one and that they could get seeds from nearby. And the roots really are, uh, the, the willows are really doing their jobs. The roots have grown uh, quite strongly. Um, they have come after four years, four meter deep and very dense, so they can really hold the sand together. But also as a co-benefit, they realized that they could attract uh, approximately 50 new wildlife species to this area. And of course, these kind of win-wins should always be kept uh, in mind. Uh, not only concentrate on this immediate, you know, uh, goal that you have here to make sure that this stretch of coast is really resilient to, um, yeah, climate change impacts, but also think twice uh, beyond immediate uh, here coastal adaptation efforts. Um, when you can do something for biodiversity at the same time, go ahead and do so. Um, now, an example from Berlin to make the connection between water adaptation and new urban developments. Uh, similarly here, um, you know, think beyond adaptation only, try to mainstream your adaptation efforts into uh, new developments. We have a lot of cities still rising in population, a lot of housing uh, projects uh, in many, many cities. So injecting a um, requirement for adaptation right into these new developments can be very impactful and effective. In Berlin, for example, um, they are profiling themselves a lot as a, a sponge city. Um, and uh, a few years ago, the Berlin Senate has agreed that decentralized stormwater management will become compulsory for any new developments. Um, they're aiming, or the, yeah, aiming at a reduction of 1% uh, of deep coupling of built areas um, from uh, storm, well, decoupling stormwater from the uh, wastewater system. And in the meantime, through this requirement, um, now there are uh, more than 1,000, well, 1,400 housing projects concerned, you know, that have to follow these requirements and will really push uh, this transition to a sponge city uh, very strongly. So these are just three relatively random examples, just going a bit through Europe and giving an insight that uh, this is happening really throughout. So, um, let me also just say um, a few words about the Green City Accord and then I will be done. Um, this is a new initiative that has just recently been launched, well, um, in, in October last year. Some of you might have heard of it. It's, it's a, a city initiative um, in which cities commit themselves to become cleaner and healthier, launched by the European Commission with the background that they have realized uh, that the environmental directives are not really implemented at the pace that they should be implemented. Um, and that is also supporting a lot of the EU Green Deal policies. Um, it has a number of areas. For us here, relevant is the water area, obviously. Other than that, it's also um, 
alluding to, to air, nature, biodiversity, waste and circular economy and noise. So um, cities signing up for the Green City Accord, amongst others, um, permit themselves to improve, improve the quality of water bodies and uh, the efficiency of water use, uh, or in more detail, uh, to improve the ecological and chemical status of our local water bodies, to contribute to the protection of water sources that supply our drinking water, and to increase the efficiency of water use in our cities by 2030. Um, so the Green City Accord, as you can see, um, is more environmentally focused, but um, we know that you know, this cannot be decoupled from thinking about climate change. Whatever we are doing in the environmental domain, we always also have to look at issues of climate change, um, integrate adaptation considerations into its work. And since we have, I guess, many city representatives sitting in the room, I just want to make you aware um, that during the Green Week, um, you can meet the Green City Accord in the virtual exhibition area on the 2nd and 3rd of June. And there's also a specific session that is more related to the water domain of the Green City Accord that is happening on the 3rd of June. If anyone is interested, maybe best to drop a message to that email below, and then we can also give you more detailed information of how you can get there, what is exactly happening there, or if you want any more information on the Green City Accord, please also visit our website. So, and also upcoming, uh, and this is uh, more related to ICLE itself, is the next uh, uh, European Urban Resilience Forum that is actually hosted by Malmö. It will still be a hybrid event. We are also still struggling with, you know, it seems like autumn will become a bit better, but maybe something that you want to scribble into your calendars in Malmö or and or online on the 19th and 20th of October. Um, also here, we will speak uh, most likely about coastal adaptation planning and a few other issues which might be of interest for some of you. With this, I'm closing. Uh, yeah, and I hand over to my next speakers, to our next speakers. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this very inspiring, interesting presentation, highlighting the importance of, of actually water sector in the building a climate uh, adaptation and climate resilience. Um, uh, actually, um, and of, of course, also thank you for the invitation to join the Green City Accord. Um, as you said, we might have quite many cities here. So actually, we can check now how many um, cities uh, we have in our audience and also what kind of other organizations do we have around so i suggest to um, to set up a poll now please uh just vote whether um which organization do you represent and then we have also at the same time one question how many of you have followed um, our ubc talks in the past series of our ubc talks webinars or are you a newcomer? So we have a, a honor to have our audience for the first time. We see that we have actually 22% of the local authorities. We have some regional authorities and, uh, oh, okay. We have a bit more of uh, research university institutions around. So uh, very good. And we have some water companies, water associations, um, uh, that's a good, I think, division of all stakeholders involved in the sustainable water management in the cities. And uh, also I can see that uh, we have uh, quite many newcomers, 61%, it's the first time. And then some 22% for, yeah, more than once. And uh, yes, also 17% have been with us uh, for a longer time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, welcome to our audience. I would like to invite our second speaker, Mr. Floris Bogart, a professor at the uh, Hanse University of Applied Sciences in Groningen and an affiliated researcher at the Global Center of Adaptation and senior consultant on water at Deltares. Floris has over 25 years experience in international climate adaptation, complex monitoring, river rehabilitation, and his in, uh, projects integrate special planning and urban water management 
with a focus on the implementation of nature-based solutions. So, Floris, I will give the floor to you and uh, we look forward to the examples of nature-based solutions, please. Yes, thank you so much. I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, of course, and a great introduction, of course, of uh, Barbara, so we can uh, dive in. Uh, Maybe a, a bit about me, I'm from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I have three jobs. Uh, I will explain that because the presentation is basically about combining the professional practice and education also research. Uh, I'm a researcher at the uh, Hanse Applied University of uh, Groningen, of course, also a consultant at Deltares, and I work as an affiliated researcher at the Global Center of Adaptation. And uh, combining these uh, might uh, uh, induce, uh, well, uh, involvement of uh, different stakeholders. So, uh, and of course, well, I'm from the Netherlands. If you have been there, you probably heard that most of the Netherlands is uh, below sea level. So uh, for implementing nature-based solutions, this uh, is regarded as the worst case scenario. We have very low permeable soil. We have very high groundwater tables, of course. So uh, that might be something that I will get back to later in this presentation. What I want to show in just 15 minutes is uh, maybe uh, the citizen uh, science, some local uh, perspective of uh, uh, in the Netherlands, but uh, Europe or uh, international for that matter. Uh, two tools that you can use that you can participate in, and that will be Climate Scan and it will be Climate uh, Cafe. So I'm just going to tell, it's going to be fast. I'm just going to browse through like a book uh, in the bottom. Uh, since most of you are researchers, there is uh, a lot of open source publications that you can uh, find more information. So I hope this uh, will find you as a, as a pleasant laid back, uh, watch some pictures and see what's happening. Um, challenge of urban, uh, uh, of course, addressed already by Barbara. It, it's very, uh, uh, well, for the Dutch perspective, for example, we also have the dikes, of course, that can break. We have subsidence, which is uh, quite a problem. So every country, of course, has their own um, worst case uh, scenarios, so to say. So these are some examples that actually nature-based solution, uh, solutions are a solutions for. So, and just to be brief, there are a lot of things. Uh, Spawn cities has been addressed uh, from China to Berlin, as we saw as a as a uh, best management practices. Uh, so there's a lot basically what we could do. The most important thing uh, addressed also by the Global Center of Adaptation and the latest uh, uh, publications is that we need that uh, participation, the stakeholders, because of course it's a global. Uh, mitigation adaptation is global but the, the 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 effects are very local and you have to act very local and you have to deal with stakeholders with citizens basically because we're working in their backyard so that, that's that's a difficult part and things that you can help are tools climate adaptation tools with a lot of examples where you can find them because that's i'm not going to show every example which is out there of course but i'm going to teach you where to find them and how to uh, use them so these are a lot of platforms all around the world i'm going to focus on uh, one which is uh, climate scan hosted at uh, this university the hansa uh, basically but is international connected to uh, well a lot of you are researchers so uh, some of you will find this uh, uh, familiar um, a recent book nature-based solutions in europe is is this one, uh, as you can see, climate scan is one of them. Uh, what I like about it, I will tell you, is uh, that it is really citizen science. It's the only one that you you yourself can put up your projects where you're proud of. And uh, we analyze that to make uh, our work easier and to connect to people, which is the most important thing and makes the platform uh, well available since 2014 already. Most of the platforms are related to a certain project, an EU project, for example, which goes two or three years and after that well platforms tend to be more uh, being less interactive or or even uh, online so what is so special about it it's well with citizen sciences is that it's free which is quite important uh, to get more uh, collaboration. Uh, it has very detailed information, uh, which location you can visit. Uh, and it's, it's well, the information is there, what you put on it, so to say. 
uh, it's interactive. It's it's well, fifty percent here's uh, research issue. You might like that most of the research uh, is added to that certain point, so you can also see where it is, but also how it functioned, which is uh, quite nice. Um, and it's linked to uh, activities as Climate Cafe, but I'm going to browse through that later. So how does it look? It's basically a, a, a Google map. Uh, it has uh, 6,000 projects all around the world. Uh, it has a, a lot of uh, different topics, which I'm going to show uh, later. It has over a 1,000 registered users that upload projects. Uh, and uh, it has a, a, an app. So if you're in the field and you see Green Roof, you can just put it put it on there. So some of the best management practices, uh, uh, international ones here, uh, China, uh, Dresden, art related, uh, Malmo, we have uh, a very uh, green wall in uh, Spain, which is actually a tourist attraction now, uh, and uh, some uh, homes in Thailand. So there are a lot of things that you can find on that. And uh, most about 2,000 projects are uh, in the Netherlands. It's it's uh, it's quite a diverse one, as you can see here. It's a, a green infrastructure, so nature-based solutions mostly. So that's uh, rain gardens, swales, uh, could be uh, green roofs. So you can find a lot of things there. And the great thing is that people themselves put it on. That's why it's the biggest uh, inventory of uh, uh, green infrastructure uh, around the world. So it's a database, and it's uh, well, it's being made by people like Thomas who's uh, on the, the right side, uh, laying on the floor, making uh, beautiful pictures and uploading them to the website. And there are a thousand people like Thomas, but Thomas is of course unique. Uh, so I will share another slide of, of him uh, being in, in, in strange uh, positions to uh, get the best pictures. And, and well, basically for you to see the examples that he find very interesting. Well, why is this uh, quite important? Um, well, when, he, when we lie on the ground and we make uh, uh, weird pictures, people come out and they would say, why are you making pictures of my front, uh, front lawn, uh, which is a swill, for example. As you can see in this article, it's about interaction. People uh, are quite mad. Why are you doing this? And we get a talk. We explain them. This is a bioswill. Most people don't even know it. So, and then we ask them, how does it function? Are you satisfied? What could be improved? And we share that in the articles like this with the, with the stakeholders as the water authority and the municipality. It's quite fun to do. We travel a lot and we have a lot of engagement. It, it's very bottom up, as you could see. So a lot of talks. Uh, getting very valuable information on what works or not works, because it's not the municipality or the water authority that has uh, their opinion. And uh, basically it doesn't count if, if they're really in a neighborhood. Uh, these people are living there. They know when it's flooded, they know when it's too dry, they know when it's too hot. So it's very valuable information. And of course, uh, that doesn't give a very uh, objective perspective for a researcher, but storytelling is quite an important thing. So that's why we also do research on some locations that might be not uh, the best uh, solutions or regarded by the stakeholders as best solutions. So what I do as a hobby, uh, I go around uh, the country, but also in uh, international, and I flood uh, water squares. I flood swales and rain gardens and basically uh, flood them on a large scale, not small uh, small measurements. But uh, people go out and they say, what, what are you doing? Why are you flooding my square? It's a water square, did you know? And we get the whole uh, conversation going. And we, uh, of course, uh, publish all the results on a scientific level, uh, what the hydraulic capacity is of these uh, functioning things. So that's quite nice uh, research. Uh, this is some uh, pictures of last week. We went in a climate cafe in the Drents Overijsels Delta. It's the higher part of the Netherlands. It's, it's really beautiful. And uh, we did a lot of floodings and gathered a lot of information, had talks with uh, a lot of citizens, which is quite nice. One thing I got from the last speaker, Barbara, is uh, when you think water adaptation, uh, think also biodiversity. And that's something I, I took uh, from this because you see grass, it's lawns, why is it not more biodiversity? Because if you have more uh, plants growing with different root sizes, uh, you get more hydraulic uh, capacity as well. And it can actually uptake some of the pollutants that are in the, in the soil. Anyway, 
so uh, on the website you can find uh, well uh, also uh, floating urbanization for example or some things opportunity of adaptation so citizens will uh, speak to stakeholders and say well this lawn could be lower and then it will be an infiltration uh, uh, field for example so that that's quite nice well heat stress measures there's a lot on it you, you can find it yourself and just browse through in the neighborhood where you might be living uh, or be now in a pandemic so to say what i find very interesting and we published uh, is uh, what is the most viewed uh, and uh, to a surprise of course there's some very very famous uh, uh, green infrastructure nature-based solutions but there are actually a lot of small municipalities that make uh, great simple things that are cost effective and uh, and uh, very likable and uh, these are this this is uh, just a, a a glance through of 16 16 of these most of them in the netherlands because it's used most in the netherlands but it, it's quite nice to see and there's a lot of biodiversity here so i think that that's one message we could take out from from this as well so uh, so we analyze this well just to show you a uh, deep dive uh, on the left there's a, a gully free road uh, there's no stormwater drainage anymore. The road is the stormwater drainage, functioned very well, uh, had a great video of 60 millimeters an hour and, uh, and did a great job. On the on the right, there are some rain gardens in Amsterdam South. Uh, it's a public space, actually not private space, but the people love it because they think I have a bigger garden. And so and the house prices went up. So some of, some of these, every location has their own story and that makes it uh, for me uh, very valuable. So uh, you can go around some of the green buildings uh, uh, as you can see here on the on the right or some playgrounds that are used also for uh, climate adaptation uh, as you can see so there's a lot to see also what does that uh, give you because it's another country uh, you're uh, from the, the baltic region well we use this in uh, projects uh, we do uh, research on the literature what what might work or what is already out there in uh, in, in 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 your region uh, where you would live and these are just uh, a grasp that we uh, find uh, which is most viewed in uh, nordic countries or in uh, latvia estonia uh, so th there's a, there's a lot of out there so uh, that might be an inspiration not gonna uh, get them to those as i said it's more valuable to see how you can find them so what can you find uh, well the um, uh, uh, riga uh, kdansk uh, there's some in uh, tallinn uh, uh, some things that you can see and we use that for guidelines what does work uh, when is it implemented when it's uh, already out there for a long period it might have uh, the suggestion that it's working uh, otherwise they might have removed it but we would know that it doesn't work so these kind of things we are putting uh, in this project, for example, uh, with Clean Tech Latvia, and I uh, saw you rises in the call as well. So uh, welcome. Uh, you, you can make uh, help people to see what works or not, and and vary on a, on a visual way, as you can see here. And also, uh, of course, in, in in Holland, we are uh, working with this almost uh, 30 years now. So we have guidelines, specific guidelines for bioswales or or uh, rain gardens, and you can enjoy them as well. Not go to into deep. If you have a location of these swales and when you mapped, if you go to the Netherlands, you would push in the Legenda bioswales. There are about a thousand locations already. What you can see here and relating to the first uh, uh, map that I showed where the Netherlands is flooded, most of the water authorities think you cannot infiltrate in the lower parts of the Netherlands. But as you can see here, uh, it's actually all around the Netherlands. So that's a very good part to take off. So when you have locations and you map all these nature-based solutions with the help of citizen science, you can do great analysis. And you can answer good questions. Like I had a talk with this guy, he said, well, I'm not going to implement nature-based solutions because that induces mosquitoes. It's a warmer climate, mosquitoes would come. Well, that's actually not true because the hydraulic capacity of these swales are being tested and they're empty in one or two days. And a mosquito needs seven days on warm and very good quality water. So an issue in the Netherlands as well. So, so with this, uh, you, we can uh, combine maps of mosquitoes and uh, locations of nature-based solutions and actually make uh, analyzing things. And what I also do when I go treasure hunting, so to say, when I see green walls or anything, uh, the location is very important, what kind of district it is. Because in the center of the city, it will be totally different what you can do in the outskirts of the city, having more space, more green space. So that's very important to analyze as well. We write, well, books and articles about it, but mostly you can see that on climate scan and visit yourself. And we can make a DNA of a city as well. So these are 
two cities on the left one I'm here now it's Groningen you can see that a lot of bioswales and uh, green roofs is actually the the core of uh, these uh, this city and then also uh, from other cities like Enschede it will be uh, maybe the other way around the first swales being implemented in the Netherlands were in Enschede and then uh, you can see what kind of pellet they are using and maybe what is not being used and might be a good suggestion to push forward or maybe not uh, that's something uh, we discuss with stakeholders as the municipality. So the last part uh, is about the research because it's not only the location and knowing where they are, but also if they function as well. And uh, again, this we will do also with the involvement of citizens and stakeholders, of course. Uh, Climate Cafe is a field education. Uh, you cannot learn a lot by models if you don't know if they actually work. And models have to be taught uh, how nature-based solutions work. So we go out, uh, we learn in the field what they look like. This is in Malmo, Sweden by the way and it's really about how i function as well i don't learn if i'm not getting involved uh you know you can tell me and i will forget you can show me and i will remember but involve me and i will understand so it's really in the next pictures which i will browse through you see uh, people in groningen but also in riga in 2019 we really get out there and really get the stories of people of stakeholders what is uh, around the world and what we can learn from and be inspired about because it's not only in Groningen and Riga it's uh, all around the world as you can see I do a lot of work in uh, Asia for example uh, which has uh, different problems which might be more related to water quality but nature-based solutions can have a very good impact on the, the purification of, uh, of water of course by, by infiltration. Not going to the other countries, let's say in, uh, in Europe, uh, it's really about uh, showing and don't tell another guy uh, that is very wise, uh, doubt this origin of wisdom, some things don't work. And if you flood a permal pavement like this and you see the infiltration rate is not enough, people will learn. These are all people from water authorities and municipalities, and they have to uh, get into the field and show them how it works. And, uh, and then we can get more uh, improvement of these systems or uh, prove that we need maintenance to ensure that they are working for a longer time. So this involvement of stakeholders is uh, quite relevant. And before I only uh, will uh, cite uh, old man, uh, I think Barrow was totally right in the first uh, that uh, let's work with stakeholders, but that are relevant. And that is a very good uh, question. Because now as well in the poll, we're, we're mostly with researchers and uh, as a researcher, I mostly I hang out with researchers. But it's it's very important for my work to hang out with uh, the, the practice and uh, of course the citizens that uh, have uh, most of the answers. So just short, uh, the metal for climate uh, cafe, uh, most important thing is that it's interdisciplinary. It will depend uh, if I would ask this nature-based solution, would it work or not? It depends if I uh, ask it to uh, a guy who's uh, an ecologist or a hydraulic uh, professor or or anything. So we have different work packages, which is about uh, water quality, it's about hydraulic capacity, it's about heat stress, it's about uh, the, the mapping, which is quite nice, and then uh, soil quality, and it could be storytelling, which I which I uh, like the most, actually, because of the involvement. So just to browse through some of these things, storytelling, we ask people, residents, uh, how does it work? And experts, of course, what kind of research has been done? We go out, and uh, this is uh, Augustenburg uh, uh, in Melmo, a uh, really inspiring place. Uh, almost 30 years uh, ago, they started as well. It's an example, best management uh, example of the Netherlands. In two days, we we gathered about 200 points on uh, on climate scan, and uh, of course, we did the analyzing like the cities at Enschede and uh, Groningen. A lot of points, and then you can see green roofs are really popular in that region. And not surprisingly, the Green Roof Institute is there, for example. And we go out and we search after almost 30 years if there's any pollution in the rain gardens and the swales. In this case, uh, it is good housekeeping. There were not uh, very uh, high uh, pollutants, but it could be, of course, after that time. And we went out with underwater drones to see with sensors and cameras and, and see what kind of uh, water quality is uh, in these uh, different regions. Because 
could see the results here. And also, as I uh, said before, if you're interested in this, it's not the topic of this, uh, this uh, talk, of course, but you can see the open source uh, scientific publications where you can find more info. And the hydro hydraulic conductivity, of course, we did uh, that in the swales of Malmo, but also in some swales in the Netherlands under different circumstances like drought and also flooding. And it's really interesting. And well, I get to publish it. So that, that's quite nice. And we biked around to see what kind of uh, measures there are out there. And then we attach sensors, uh, temperature sensors to the bikes. And uh, we would find heat stress maps where it is hotter and mostly when there's no green and, uh, and water. And that proves, of course, for stakeholders that they might want to do something. And it was lovely in Melmo to bike around because it's not in every city that you can uh, bike around freely, uh, as I saw this picture, uh, uh, near the canals, a uh, biking path in uh, Amsterdam. And of course, uh, it's great biking. Anyway, closing up. Uh, wise words from man and woman, uh, uh, tell me and I will forget, uh, doubt is the origin of wisdom, so be very critical also, uh, not only positive about nature-based solutions, but uh, tackle uh, the main questions like the mosquitoes or anything. Some are really, really easy to, to, uh, to uh, disprove. We did learn from uh, history and we should uh, by uh, mapping them and uh, taking all this research uh, as we've done in Melmo, but all around the world, also in Riga and other places. And I would love to go to one of the cities that you are in, for example. So let's work with stakeholders are relevant. Of course, I think the, the S in nature-based solutions, of course, it's a solution to climate adaptation and the S in sustainable. Uh, some are out there for more than 30 years. So I, I think there's uh, sustainable. It's a proof itself that they're still there and are on the map. So involving citizens, I think I proved that it, it's very valuable for uh, for a lot of people. And uh, let's share uh, your challenges and solutions, of course. Uh, and I hope you will join and put your projects on uh, Climate Scan and Climate Cafe. So I'm gonna uh, stop there because I have no time if I was too enthusiastic and that maybe uh, was out of time. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Flores. It was really inspiring. And uh, yes, I hope that uh, also our audience <laughs> will have a lot of questions to you and definitely visit your um, climate scan and join perhaps the climate cafes whenever possible. I think we have uh, quite uh, many uh, good solutions to share from our region. So definitely um, let's uh, cooperate better on that. And now uh, let's move to our uh, third speaker, Mr. Pekka Parkila. And uh, he's a water management expert at Southwest Finland Center for Economic Development, Transport and Environment. He is an experienced project manager with a long history of working in the public um, policy industry on issues related to climate sustainability. And pretty recently, he's been involved in the project Baltic Sea Cooperation for Climate Resilience and will present um, natural flood risk management solutions. So, Pekka, I will now hand over to you, please. Great. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Angeles, for the presentation uh, and introduction. Uh, so, my name is Pekka Parkela. Uh, I work in the Center for uh, Economic. Uh, development, transport, and the environment in southwestern Finland. And uh, today I'm here to talk about the natural flood risk management solutions in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, uh, it's the, the my presentation is about the report that we made on the project uh, Baltic Sea Cooperation for Climate Resilience that was funded by Finland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We started in, in October 2019, and we are about to wrap up uh, end of this year. Uh, the project is coordinated by, by the ELI Center, meaning my organization. And uh, we do it in, in uh, uh, co-work with, uh, with the uh, Finnish Environmental Institute and uh, Finnish uh, Institute of Natural Resources. Um, in this project, we made four reports, and one of these reports is the nature-based solutions, and which is the topic of my presentation today. Uh, in the project, project we're also going to make uh, three, uh, three uh, workshops. 
uh, and one per benchmarking visit, hopefully in the autumn, if the Corona situation allows it. And in, in November, there will be a final webinar, which will be in English. And I, uh, I will relay the links and, and um, request for, for uh, UBC to relay to you all the participants today. So to the report, uh, the natural flood risk management solutions in the Baltic Sea region uh, report was made by uh, Antti Parjanne and Mika Martonen from the Finnish Environmental Institute during 2020. Uh, and the basic idea was to survey the coastal, uh, coastal countries of Baltic Sea to benchmark the best practices on flood risk management and more specifically the nature-based solutions in them. Uh, the research was conducted uh, by literature review and interviews covering eight countries over there. So basically, the gentleman here uh, inter, uh, looked at the literature on uh, what are the challenges of nature-based solutions, what is the current state of uh, different countries, uh, what are the uh, policies and law uh, situation, and then uh, what are the best practices. And in this presentation, I will uh, try to summarize the key findings in this report. Uh, sadly, the, the report is only in Finnish, although there is an English summary, summary in there. And for the Finnish audience, audience uh, and although everyone can download from that, that link over there. Uh, however, uh, we made a four reports and uh, the combined English summary of all the reports will be made before the end of this year and will be uh, published in the, in the final webinar. So what are the nature-based solutions? Uh, Floris and Barbara already mentioned, mentioned something and I trust that, that the, the audience is, is somewhat uh, familiarized with the, with the concept, but uh, I quote the, the International Union of uh, Conservative of Nature uh, designation here that the actions to protect sustainability, manage and uh, restore a natural or modified ecosystems that address uh, societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Uh, that's the one definition for it, and that's the nature-based solutions. But the, when we talk about nature-based solutions, we, uh, there's, uh, in literature, there's uh, also references in, in, in several other names to the basically the same topic or the same uh, measures that we can do to underline the nature-based solutions. But basically, in, in layman terms, it's we, uh, we build or we reconstruct the nature's uh, solutions in, uh, in upstream or in the city to, uh, to help us control the, the hydraulical effects. That is the risk that we are focusing on. Uh, here's the picture from, uh, from UK's environmental agency that uh, resembles the part of the myriad of, of, of different uh, things that go under the topic of nature-based solutions. Uh, but the basic idea of these nature-based solutions is either it absorbs the water, like the, uh, the sponge, the sponge city idea, um, or or soil and land management to better, better the hydrology of the soil. It absorbs the water so it won't go into the, into the river so fast and therefore it won't create the floods. The uh, other possible thing is that it slows down. That's, the, that's probably the main thing, main thing that the, all the flood, uh, flood management is about. It, uh, 
it slows down the current of the water so that it won't buck down into these narrow corridors that are are in the city cities uh, and and uh, by doing so many of these nature based solutions uh, redirect the uh, water flow into the open plains where the infrastructure where there are no infrastructure or uh, or the damage that could be done uh, by the water uh, is more easily fixable or or cheaper to fix. Uh, whatever method is used, the it should be selected by the type of the flood, circumstances in the uh, in the area, what kind of um, uh, uh, land use is there, what kind of a uh, water basin is it in general. And when selecting the method to use in this uh, frontier economics uh, table here, there's a um, there is the soft engineering, again, a one term for nature based solutions uh, uh, versus the nature based solutions and the hybrid solutions. And in these, uh, these uh, three categories, there should be always remember uh, nature based solutions are not the most uh, acutely effective measures. When there is an imminent threat, to flooding, they should be used uh, gray solutions. Uh, if there's time and long term solution should be always the, the nature based solutions and uh, then the hybrid solutions, meaning that we integrate the nature based solutions and gray solutions or more traditional solutions into a, a combined combined uh, solution and that that could be the uh most effective and cost beneficial way to do it uh, so the report was about the nations of the baltic sea and how we in the uh, baltic sea countries do uh, nature-based solutions uh, i took this uh, uh, this tab uh, table from from the report and translated into english uh, it's uh, it shows uh, very well that that uh, the population or in inhabitants that are, are in the risk of flood will increase uh, dramatically uh, during the next next decades, and at the same time, at the same level, the uh, the damage cost, the expected damage cost, will also increase significantly. And then again, if we uh, make adaption measures we can uh, we can lower that uh, damage cost effectively and that's the main idea why should you do it do uh, flat uh, flat ma management in the first place and nature based solutions are even cheaper um, all of these countries that we did in this report uh, had somewhat implemented and nature-based solutions. So it's not foreign to any of these, any of uh, Baltic Sea states, but they're mainly done in small scale, uh, small uh, water bodies uh, or, 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 or city implementations. Um, so the broad scale implementation is required more to, to have an actual impact on the flood management. So the, what are the challenges in Baltic city countries? I tried to summarize in this, this slide. Uh, the organizational issues. And uh, it was brought up that almost all countries have some issues with organizing uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, whether it's legislation that is tracking the implementation down, uh, land ownership, uh, funding, something. And the it is, well, we're connected to the lack of knowledge uh, that has not been brought into the uh, legislation or, or the, uh, the uh, implementation in general. Uh, the uh, nature-based solutions is as a term; it is widely known. But uh, but when the 
when when doing plants and flood management, it's usually still the tend to tend to go to the uh, gray methods and the nature-based solutions uh, are uh, in a secondary state. Uh, the third one is a narrow scope of the nature-based solutions, uh, which I already mentioned that when the nature-based solutions are doing some small things, specific uh, problem, therefore the results are also left uh, very limited. Uh, however, there are some, some great examples. There's a lot of more in the, in the report. I just brought a few of them here. And luckily, uh, Floris uh, brought some, some more in, in his presentation already. And um, the forest mentioned Malmo and the Augustenborg uh, program was made in, if there's someone in the audience, please correct me uh, in the end. Uh, the uh, 1990s started this, uh, this project where it's uh, part of the city, of course, Augustenborg uh, was uh, then commissioned to be this kind of green city effort. And uh, uh, the why I bought it, bought it in here uh, was the, the stakeholder participation. And they did very well there. They gathered a group of uh, inhabitants, policymakers, and, and um, uh, engineers to do the whole planning in there. And it has been a success story ever since. Poland is a great example of, uh, of increasing the water retention area. Uh, uh, in the in the country, um, uh, and they did it by integrating small water retention retention uh, areas uh, to combat drought, and at the same time they they help the flooding problem in, in the waterways. And Lithuania has the same kind of a like Poland, but they did it on the wetlands. They uh, where Poland they try to combat drought. In the forestry sector, the uh, Lithuania uh, example was that they tried to restore biodiversity in the wetlands. And by doing so, they actually, uh, actually did the uh, same water retention uh, over the wetland area. And, uh, and why I brought it here was they had a good exam example of cross sectoral cooperation. And finally, the Denmark example they had this uh, building with nature uh, project that uh, uh, the good examples there was the landowner guided planning uh, and coastal politics integrated into a municipal planning uh, yeah so some notes and recommendations of the report itself the nature-based solution should be integrated into other plans for visibility. For, um, for it often, uh, the nature-based solutions, if you made it in a whole uh, own strategy of nature-based solutions, uh, it tends to, it tends to be left out of the spotlight. Uh, and when you integrate it into the flood planning, into the climate change adaptation plans, then, then there is uh, always uh, it's integrated into the same toolbox as every other method in that box, and it also might help with the funding of the uh, nature-based solutions on flood risk. Uh, prioritizing the, the methods used. Uh, there's an example in this uh, right side of a good. Uh, way of um, implementing uh, hybrid solution uh, so that the city won't get flooded, there won't be a problem in the downstream, but the uh, fields are flooded instead. Yeah. Uh, standardizing the evaluation, uh, evaluation effectiveness of the plans and the uh, stakeholder participation that Floris and Barbara already mentioned. Those are the keys to make the uh, nature-based solutions planning effective. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much, Pekka, for uh, this overview and providing us the state of play in the region, how we are doing with the flood protection. A uh, very interesting presentation. This presentation will be available afterwards. Um, and uh, let's move on. Thank you very much, Pekka, once again. Let's move on to our um, uh, final speaker, uh, Ivar Annos, a professor and vice dean for academic affairs from the Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture at Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, Ivar's teaching and research fields are linked with the energy efficiency of water networks and development of smart solutions for urban water systems. And recently, um, he is involved in the EU-funded project NOAA, dealing with preparedness to extreme weather events and protecting the Baltic Sea from the untreated um, wastewater spillages during the flood event. So, uh, Ivar, uh, please, uh, we are looking forward to uh, your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for a very nice introduction. And um, today I'm giving a uh, short overview of uh, our project, uh, the NOAA project results. Uh, and the idea was uh, to prepare us all, uh, all the um, involved uh, cities and uh, uh, for extreme weather events. And of course, uh, give guidelines to others uh, how, to, uh, how to do it and how to manage uh, in the new, let's say, under the new climate scenarios that we will uh, face probably uh, in the near future. So I will um, give you a very short overview of the NOAA project concept uh, just to get you on the same paper. Uh, and then I will concentrate on the measures that we implemented. Uh, so we have divided those into active measures that you can do uh, so to improve the existing infrastructure, for example, and uh, to passive measures uh, that you can use uh, to analyze how your systems work at the moment and uh, how you can improve them uh, so you, can, you are more prepared uh, for the future. And uh, I will conclude my presentation with some uh, lessons learned, let's say. And, um, and here's a picture of us uh, starting in um, 2019. And um, uh, basically there are a lot of us, uh, like you can see, because the NOAA project involves actually 18 partners from uh, six different countries. So we have uh, three uh, water companies and uh, we have six municipalities, uh, then some academies uh, and uh, umbrella organizations as well, um, water associations from Estonia and Poland and so on. And we have some, um, um, uh, let's say, involved partners uh, like UBC uh, and the uh, Ministry of uh, Environment in Estonia, for example. Uh, just to have this um, better uh, stakeholder in involvement and uh, to ensure the sustainability of, of the project results as well. So in a very short um, way, I can present uh, the main objectives um, in, let's say, two paragraphs. So the first objective of NOAA was to decrease uh, the discharges of uh, different pollutants uh, from urban uh, stormwater runoff to the Baltic Sea. And then one of the Mm, ways how we plan to do it was uh, to decrease the uh, flooding risk in urban environment and then uh, this way we can actually prevent uh, the um, let's say bad water quality runoff uh, to the surrounding water bodies as well and uh, the solution that we um, mm, uh, developed in the project uh, was this kind of a planning support system that we call extreme weather layer and uh, that I'm going to present you in the latter phases of this uh, presentation. And the second objective was uh, to do something um, reactively, let's say, um, so to decrease uh, the spillages of untreated wastewater from the urban drain systems uh, already now, so that uh, we, we wanted to find uh, some ways. They were, I will present them, uh, and you can see that they are quite simple, but um, um, there are still some um, measures how we can actually make the existing infrastructure more uh, climate proof uh, just by adding a few, let's say, smart uh, urban drains uh, system elements uh, to the existing and integrated with existing systems. So the pilot uh, activities were um, done in uh, six pilot sites and um, in uh, Sweden, in Söderam, in Finland, in Pori, in Estonia, in Rakvara and Absalom, sorry, in eight, and uh, in Latvia, in Liepa, Jurmal and Ogre, and in uh, Poland, in Slupsk. So uh, in some of the cases, we just um, 
uh, implemented uh, passive measures and in some cases both active and passive measures as well. So in the next few slides, I will give you an overview of some of the examples. I will not go uh, through all the pilots, but uh, just uh, stress out uh, some of the, let's say, main results. So uh, first about the active measures. Um, the active measures uh, were a little bit different in different pilot uh, sites. In Estonia, we actually implemented this kind of a smart infrastructure elements uh, uh, to control uh, the flows in the, in the urban drain systems a little bit better. And in, in other pilots uh, in the Latvian uh, cities and in, in, in Poland, in Slups, we actually uh, just um, implemented uh, monitoring devices just to get to know what is happening in the system before we can actually um, implement any control devices. Um, and uh, as you can see, we haven't involved we, or we didn't involve any large cities um, or mostly uh, we didn't involve large cities. And this was actually intention uh, because, um, because of two things. Uh, one is that um, smaller pilots are um, very nice playgrounds for scientists uh, like us. Uh, they are flexible and uh, different things can be actually implemented quite easily and quite uh, fast. And the second thing was, uh, is that uh, usually the lack of uh, knowledge and lack of staff uh, that are actually dealing with, let's say, flood reduction uh, uh, implementation and, and so on. Usually there are personnel that uh, have multiple tasks and uh, this is just one of the tasks that they should uh, focus as well. Okay, uh, now results. So here's an example of uh, monitoring devices that were uh, implemented or installed in different uh, pilot sites. Uh, example of Jurmala here presented. Uh, they selected three uh, different pilot sites uh, shown here, A, B, and C, and um, rain gauges were installed, um, flow monitoring devices, uh, water quality was, uh, was analyzed um, during different periods. So the NOAA project just gave them a possibility to get to know their system uh, and the system dynamics uh, uh, more uh, so that the urban drainage system is just is not just a black box where water flows in and water flows out, but actually they, they get to know the system and the system responds uh, to different climate uh, um, scenarios uh, better as well. Uh, and similar approach was uh, was done in different uh, in, uh, in the other Latvian cities and, and in the in Slupsk in uh, Poland as well. But in Estonia, we went a step uh, fur further and um, here are examples of those it's kind of a smart uh, urban drainage uh, system elements that were installed uh, to improve uh, the, um, the operation of the existing urban drainage system it, to increase its capacity where, ne where it's uh, needed the most. And, uh, and um, there were other uh, pos positive effects uh, uh, like you can see as well, and I will stress them out uh, for you. So here's an example of Harpsalo. Uh, the urban drain system in Harpsalo is uh, flowing out to a natural wetland. And the natural wetland and the sea are actually uh, divided by an old uh, uh, railway dam. And now you can see that at the moment, this railway dam is, is uh, reconstructed uh, for pedestrians so they can just enjoy the seaside uh, um, and it's a, it's a very nice uh, scenery. Uh, and this wetland was connected uh, with the sea through um, connection pipes. And the connection pipes were, um, the, um, they were operated by a manual valve. So one could just go and open and uh, close them uh, where needed. Uh, and the um, um, threat here is that um, at least two times a year, the sea level uh, is, uh, is so high that uh, the water starts to flow into the urban drain system. And of course, uh, if, it, if the drain system or some parts of it uh, are already flooded uh, with seawater, then in case of heavy rainfall events, uh, there is not enough capacity for the excess rainwater and there will be floods in the city. And um, I was there in um, 2018, I think, um, just relaxing, uh, in a spa and um, I got caught by an extreme weather event and I saw that uh, the streets were all flooded uh, and there, there uh, are actual problems that uh, we tackled in this project. 
And uh, now uh, the uh, water level differences are measured. So the water level at the sea side and at the wetland are monitored continuously. And this kind of a smart wearable system uh, uh, operates uh, by itself, uh, adjusts uh, the opening position of, of the connection pipe. Um, and uh, uh, if needed, it restricts uh, the inflow from the seaside to the wetland. And this enables uh, uh, to have more capacity in the urban drainage system in case of uh, uh, large um, uh, storm events. And the second positive effect is that um, if we um, uh, increase the detention time uh, or retention time uh, for the uh, storm water then at the wetland, then it, the water will be purified as well. Uh, and the second uh, pilot is in Rakvara, which is a smaller uh, municipality in Estonia as well. And here, um, the idea was similar, that let's trick the inflow uh, to the um, uh, existing drain system at the point where it can be restricted. So uh, Rockware uh, uh, case is um, a little bit complicated because there is a natural river that is actually um, flowing through the municipality or the city center and at, at some point it is uh, directed to a collector. So at the upstream end, um, it's in a, its natural body, but at, at some point it's in a collector. And um, therefore the capacity of the collector is uh, reduced constantly. And in case of heavy rainfall events, again, we, have, um, uh, we don't have the maximum capacity of the system to direct all the excess water from the um, uh, city center. So for that, uh, we actually use this uh, natural um, uh, bond here and reconstructed the overflow that was there initially anyway. And um, there was a smart weir wall system uh, placed um, on top of the weir, uh, on top of the weir. Uh, and uh, this um, restricts the flow to the collector if needed. And basically it uh, again operates uh, automatically. It measures water level at some point uh, in the collector and water level uh, in a pond. And based on the water level differences, it uh, just adjusts, uh, adjusts the outflow to the collector. And uh, the other positive effect is that um, uh, the city itself uh, reconstructed the whole area. And now the bridge uh, is uh, equipped with LED lights and so on. So it's a nice uh, scenery as well for the, uh, for the, for the um, habitants. So, Another uh, approach was uh, to implement passive measures, um, basically what to do, where are the risk uh, flood prone areas in the urban er environment and what to do in order to re reduce the risks. So the goal here is to, to make the existing uh, cities more climate proof. And for that, uh, this kind of a planning support system that we call the extreme weather layer was created. It's based on the digital twin of the existing system, and it takes uh, into account what kind of a land use, what kind of a soil types you have in the, in the urban environment, and so on. So um, it, is, it can be built up uh, based on those uh, six steps. So first, you need a lot of data uh, um, from the municipality, and that's why the inclusion of uh, smaller municipalities was uh, very right uh, thing to do uh, because the data acquisition was uh, a little bit uh, faster. Then you, of course, you have to uh, build up your models uh, that uh, you can use uh, for the scenario analysis, then define your catchments, where the water is flowing into the system and so on. Then define your scenarios, what do you want to analyze, identify where your flood prone areas are and identify what are the acceptance rates uh, that when you can say that, that this flood risk here is low or moderate or high and, and this, uh, like we experienced, has to be done uh, for all the municipalities um, by themselves. So this is not uh, uh, this kind of a universal thing to do. So a few maps uh, to present you the results. So the extreme weather layer can be presented in two ways. Uh, you can present it in a catchment view. So uh, basically in a traffic light manner, you can see that uh, where are the flood prone areas in an urban environment. Here's an example of Hapsalo. So uh, green areas implement low risk or uh, stress low risk. Uh, yellow is uh, moderate risk and the uh, red areas are uh, at high flooding risk. And uh, here are three scenarios uh, today. Uh, the middle one is uh, the future climate scenario RCP 4.5 and uh, 
the right one is uh, RCP 8.5. And you can see that the, when we take into account uh, the future climate scenarios, the flood risks um, uh, get higher. And of course, now the uh, urban planner can actually uh, say that the whether what we can do or what are the areas that need uh, further consideration, for example. And you can, uh, you can present the same thing in a plot-based view. Here's an example of 40, uh, today's map and uh, RCP 8.5. And uh, in a similar approach in a traffic light manner, we have just uh, um, presented uh, the flood prone areas in the, in the city. Again, uh, urban planner can uh, assess that, okay, if uh, we do not do anything, this is an area that will be flooded in, in future. And this is an area where it will get uh, worse and, and so on. But another question is that uh, what we can do. Uh, so this is just an, uh, this uh, view just gives you an overview that where are the problems? But uh, uh, the next step would be that what we can do. And of course, there has been a lot of uh, good examples uh, by uh, Floris and, uh, and by Becca as well, that uh, integration of nature-based solutions and so on. So I'm just make, making here one example of Söderham. So, what they have done is uh, they have uh, investigated uh, extreme weather layers. This is the catchment view and the pot based view. They have um, uh, specified one area that is red with a high risk. Uh, and then uh, on top of this layer, they have created their own layer. Where are the green areas in, in the urban environment? And where are the green areas that are owned by the municipality? And uh, from there, they, can, they have uh, defined that, okay, here actually there's a park uh, which is owned by the municipality uh, and this is the same area that's under high flooding risk at the moment and now the next step for this extreme weather layer um, implementation is that uh, we will include this nature-based solution or whatever um, flood risk management uh, solution uh, to the model analyze different scenarios how will it would impact uh, this area and the surrounding areas or maybe we, sh we shouldn't do anything here maybe even upstream, uh, and then we can say that, uh, or analyze it, what are the uh, good solutions to reduce the flooding risk. Okay, so uh, conclusions. I wrote down some conclusions, but uh, I will um, uh, skip them and leave them uh, for you to uh, read. But I think that um, there are a few pointers that I picked up uh, from the previous uh, presentation. And I think um, um, Barbara mentioned the very right thing that uh, actually, if you want to do anything, then the cities are the bedrock uh, of the ad adaptation. And uh, this is something we should stress in this, uh, this kind of uh, integrated projects uh, as well. And, um, and Floris men mentioned that uh, small municipalities do a lot. Uh, and actually, we do not know uh, what they are doing all, all the time. And, uh, and maybe those need to be stressed out more. And I think this project uh, that I presented you is about this as well, that the smaller municipalities that are uh, actually implementing uh, something. And I hope that every municipality in, in our NOAA project has a, their own man in a manhole uh, to uh, have this kind of a sustainability of the project outcomes that now they are going down to see what is happening in the drain systems. And now they are uh, making uh, different measures how to reduce the flood risks in the urban areas. So thank you for your time and listening and uh, waiting for questions if there are any. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva, for uh, this uh, inspiring uh, presentation and the tools that you have uh, developed in our project. Um, yes, I hope that our one of the questions was how to make sure the um, sustainability and long and take up in the region of the tools. So, um, as the Union of the Baltic Cities, we also make sure that uh, actually those uh, outputs of different project results are channeled to our member cities, and they will also sustain uh, longer, so um, more um, stakeholder experts can use them. Um, Thank you very much once again. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, the um, by saying thank you to the audience for joining and thank you to our speakers for sharing uh, very interesting presentations and discussions today. Uh, this event has been recorded and uh, in the next few days we will publish the recording on our um, UBC uh, dash sustainable.net uh, website. We will also publish all presentations, so um, just stay tuned and uh, 
Um, we have also many more events to come. Already now, I can invite you to the next UBC Talks webinar on 28 September um, on the topic circular economy. And we also have a, a bit more events in the theme of sustainable water management. So on 9, 10th uh, June, uh, the mentioned project BSR Water is organizing a summer um, conference on uh, protection of the Baltic Sea and then on 15, 16 September, also the final conference with uh, more solutions and tools to come. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And I wish you a great uh, week. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>